Hi, I'm registered dietitian Libby Parker and I specialize in eating disorders. Today I'm going to be teaching you about the four main types of eating disorders as defined in the DSM-5. Let's check it out. Hi, I'm registered dietitian Libby Parker and today I'm going to be teaching you about the four main types of eating disorders as defined in the DSM-5. So when most people think of eating disorders, they tend to think of anorexia nervosa first. So this is the one that people typically think of as underweight and here's what the DSM-5 actually says for the diagnosis. So in order to have anorexia nervosa, you must meet the following criteria. Persistent restriction of energy intake leading to a significantly low body weight in context of what is minimally expected for age, sex, developmental trajectory, and physical health. Note there's no specific weights or BMIs listed in the diagnosis. That's something new. Either an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, or a persistent behavior that interferes with weight gain, even though at a significantly low weight. And a disturbance in the ways one's body weight or shape is experienced, undue influence of body shape and weight on self-evaluation, or persistent lack of recognition of the seriousness of current low body weight. So there's two subtypes, restricting type, which is just purely restricting energy intake, and binge eating purging type, which has binge eating and or purging episodes amidst the restriction. A couple things that changed from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 are that we no longer have specific weights listed as a diagnostic feature. They are parts of the subtypes of anorexia nervosa in terms of severity, but it's no longer a diagnostic factor to have to get below a certain weight. Also, the removal of lack of menstruation for three months. For several reasons, some people were not experiencing lack of menstruation despite all of the other characteristics of anorexia and were getting misdiagnosed, so that was taken out. Also, with the advent of continual birth control, it's very difficult to tell if a period is not happening because of birth control or because of lack of intake. So that's kind of the, the general of anorexia nervosa. The next one, bulimia nervosa. This is characterized by recurrent episodes of binge eating. And an episode of binge eating is characterized by both of the following, which is eating in a discrete period of time, typically around two hours, an amount of food that is definitely larger than most people would eat during a similar period of time and under similar circumstances, and a sense of lack of control over eating during the episode, so feeling that you can't stop eating or control what or how much you're eating. In addition to that, there's also recurrent inappropriate compensatory behavior in order to prevent weight gain, such as self-induced vomiting, misuse of laxatives, diuretics, or other medications, fasting, or excessive exercise. There are other ways of compensating as well, but this is what the DSM-5 uh, actually has written down. And binge eating and appropriate compensatory behaviors both occur on average at least once a week for three months. If it's not happening this frequently, there's a different diagnosis for that, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Self-evaluation is unduly influenced by body shape and weight, similar to anorexia. And the disturbance does not occur exclusively during episodes of anorexia nervosa. Again, there's binging and a compensatory behavior for the binging, and it's happening at least once a week for at least three months in order to be diagnosed. Next one, binge eating disorder, finally got its own diagnosis when we moved to the DSM-5. Similar to parts of bulimia nervosa, this is a recurrent episode of binge eating. Same characteristics for the binge eating, eating a lot of food in a short period of time and a sense of lack of control over the eating. In addition, binge eating occurs on average at least once a week for three months. And binge eating is not associated with recurrent use of inappropriate compensatory behaviors or restriction. So the binge eating episodes are associated with three or more of the following criteria. Eating much more rapidly than normal. Eating until feeling uncomfortably full. Eating large amounts of food when not feeling physically hungry. Eating alone because of feeling embarrassed by how much one is eating feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed or very guilty after eating, and marked distress regarding binge eating is present. So another diagnosis that tends to be kind of a catch-all for anything that doesn't fit into one of those main three is other specified feeding and eating disorders. This was previously known as eating disorder not otherwise specified in the DSM-IV. So this is essentially the catch-all for things where 
we have a very defined set of behaviors, but they don't fit into anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating disorder. So this could be someone who meets all the criteria for anorexia except for one thing, or all of the criteria for bulimia nervosa except for one thing, um, or they're not doing it frequently enough, they're not hitting that at least once a week for at least three months mark yet. Also could be things like, you may have heard orthorexia, which is an obsession with clean or healthy eating, um, night eating syndrome, which is waking up in the middle of the night to eat despite having enough intake, chewing and spitting of food, pico, which is eating of non-food substances, or other similar behavioral issues. There is another diagnosis for feeding and eating disorders that is for ones that we can't define yet. So there's lots of different options. Hope this was helpful in determining the difference between our four main types of eating disorders. If you would like to learn more about eating disorders, please click the subscribe link below this video and check out the website in the description. I'll see you in the next video.